Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain, literature, fairy tales, and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original stories, not just read the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Our goal is to at least break even to cover our expenses, so any support that you can offer to help us reach that goal helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Chapter 13 The Breakup of the Big Onion Camp Part 3 As for Paul, he traveled a great distance and saw not a sign of any game. He had almost begun to despair when a great flock of fool hens or spruce partridges settled down around him. They settled on the boughs of the trees so thickly that they were crowded together on their perches as tightly as they could get, and there were so many of them that he hardly knew how to go about getting them. He was too close to use his shotgun without tearing them all to pieces, and his rifle would kill only a few with each shot. Finally, he settled the matter in a very clever way. He took his rifle bullets and punched holes in them, and then tied a long piece of fishing line to each bullet through the holes he had made. The first shot he fired, he aimed along a limb where five or six hundred partridges were sitting all in a row, and pulled the trigger. The bullet, which he had fixed up so nicely, just followed along that limb entirely through every one of those birds, carrying the fishing line with it, so that all Paul had to do was tie the ends of the line together and sling the necklace of partridges over his shoulder. He kept on stringing partridges that way until finally they became scared and what few were left flew away. By that time, however, he was pretty well laden down with birds, and he looked almost like a ball of feathers as he walked along. He was far from satisfied with his success, though. Birds were all right as appetizers, he felt, but he knew his men would prefer to stick their teeth into strong red meat. After a while, he came on some deer tracks where a large herd of the animals had passed. Big tracks they were, the biggest deer tracks he had ever seen. Elmer sniffed along, following the trail at full speed, and Paul ran along behind him, glad that at last he was within reach of the meat he wanted for the big dinner tomorrow. He followed those deer tracks all the way across northern Wisconsin and Michigan. Then suddenly they doubled back westward again, he and Elmer following right after them. But not until sundown did he get close enough to the herd that was making them to take a shot. There was a wise old buck at the head of that herd, and he had almost bested Paul. Elmer got along all right on that chase, as he was always resting one pair of legs while he ran on the other pair. But Paul, with his heavy equipment, his big load of birds, and his one pair of legs that ran continuously without any chance for rest came near to being wore out by the time he finally began to catch up with the deer. They were already back past the place where the chase had started, and the deer were running more slowly by this time. But Paul was also running more slowly, and so he sent Elmer on ahead to turn the herd while he sat down to wait until his dog drove the animals back past him. And pretty soon here they came, the whole herd of them, one after the other, and in such formation that he was able to bring down every one of them. They were all extraordinarily big deer, weighing close to a thousand pounds apiece, it is said, and Paul felt rather proud of his success. When he saw their exceptional size and counted how very many of them there were, He knew that the big dinner on the morrow would not lack for meat. Cramming a part of the animals into the big pockets of his hunting coat and slinging the rest over his shoulders, he set out for camp, glad to be carrying in such a good bag from the day's hunting. It was night when he finally got back to camp, and as he came near, he saw in the moonlight a strange dark shape reaching high in the air. 
It had not been there that morning, and he was quite puzzled as to what it could be. At last he came to it, and one may imagine his astonishment at discovering it to be a huge pile of gigantic bears. They were stacked up like logs, and around the base of the pile, Hot Biscuit Slim and hundreds of assistants were working away, butchering bear meat for all they were worth. Good for Shot Gunderson, roared Paul, greatly pleased when he was told that the hunter was responsible for bringing in the big furry creatures. It certainly looks as though he had been enjoying some good hunting, and here, Slim, is more meat to make a little variety. And he dumped down his own prodigious load of deer and partridges, while the chief cook sent cook boys scurrying away for another crew of helpers. Do your best, Slim, Paul said, for tomorrow is to be your day of glory. And hugely delighted that everything was turning out so well. The big logger hurried to the bunkhouse to congratulate his fellow hunter. What a shout of laughter he let forth when he heard the story of Shot Gunderson's experience with the wild bear. Thanks for joining us today. Check us out on Patreon. The story time level is only $3, and you can help us meet our small goal of breaking even and covering our expenses. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. If you can't afford to support us financially, go give us a good review, subscribe or follow, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. You can also send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.